<laughs> so, hi everyone. Uh, this is the talk, Old School is Still Cool. Uh, my name is Zoltan Balázs and this is Camp++. Plus Plus. Uh, some of you who don't know me, uh, I am uh, mostly into offensive research when it comes to my research time. Like uh, I developed the Zombie Browser Toolkit, the Hardware Firewall Bypass Toolkit, I have this sandbox tool, I also played crappy IoT devices and my RC exploit was implemented in a botnet which was infected infecting uh, 600,000 devices, so I am pretty proud that I wrote code which run on 600,000 devices, <laughs> yay! <laughs> so invented the idea of encrypted exploit delivery, which was later abused by some exploit kit developers. Uh, why am I talking about old school stuff? Um, recently, uh, I have seen a trend that uh, people try to rediscover stuff, uh, like when it comes to hacking techniques and vulnerabilities. And uh, meanwhile, uh, when it comes to developers, they are not rediscovering stuff, they are just uh, doing the same mistakes again and again. And uh, I'm quite fascinated uh, when it comes to old school things. Uh, I am pretty young when it comes to these topics, so uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I mostly don't have any first-hand experience on those. Uh, I try to play a little bit with all of these technologies, but uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you guys have more experience with some of these techniques. So if I'm wrong, just let me I, I, I don't like wrong. All right, so when it comes to the history of hacking, uh, the first one, which is uh, mostly mentioned everywhere, is uh, the blue box. Uh, Joy Bubbles, uh, how many of you guys have heard this name, Joy Bubbles? Yeah, not, not many. So he was basically the first guy uh, who found out that uh, you can manipulate uh, the phone system. Uh, how it really happened was that uh, he he was a blind guy and uh, he really enjoyed uh, having uh, phone calls like uh, he called uh, random numbers and things like that and uh, while he was experimenting as a child uh, calling uh, these phone numbers uh, he got a bit bored so he started to whistle and uh, once uh, he heard the click uh, sound uh, on the system and then he realized that uh, something fishy is going on. So he started to experiment uh, with the phone systems. And he quickly figured out that uh, basically by uh, whistling sounds, uh, he can uh, bypass uh, the uh, phone system in a way that you don't have to pay anything for long, long distance calls from now on. Uh, the way uh, you, would you were able to do that uh, is that uh, you called a uh, free but uh, long distance line. Uh, then you played this uh, famous uh, 26 uh, 100 uh, hertz, uh, which I'm going to show you just right now. I'm not sure you can hear it, but uh, this is what he, uh, he started to whistle. Uh, when the, he heard this uh, sound clicking. And uh, what uh, this means uh, in the phone system is that uh, the remote system thinks uh, that uh, the line was hang up, uh, but uh, the uh, local phone it was still connected uh, to the lines. So after that, uh, when someone uh, uh, played this cable stone, then dialed the number what he wanted, uh, then played the start tone. He was able to call a new number, a long distance number, without paying any cent for it. And uh, that's how all the hacking started. Um, actually, uh, Joy Bubbles, when he went to the university, he started uh, to sell these long distance calls for one USD or something like that. 
Uh, fun fact, uh, you can also build a blue box uh, with uh, Arduino and uh, there are some instructions on the internet how you can do that. Um, but how was this possible that uh, people were able to control basically the phone system via the uh, voice messages? Uh, there was a design decision at Bell uh, after the World War II that uh, they will use uh, the control signaling of the phone systems in the same line uh, as the voice, uh, which meant that uh, whoever played uh, the correct uh, frequency sounds, uh, they were able to control the phone system itself, which was a huge vulnerability. And this is how basically hacking started. Uh, this is Joy Bubbles, uh, enjoying his hobby, uh, being on the phone and uh, calling people. Uh, I was thinking about uh, how people are making the same mistakes uh, and uh, turns out that uh, even with these modern uh, voiceover IP systems, uh, you can still have uh, sometimes free calls uh, when it comes to, for example, weak passwords. Uh, but uh, even though uh, we can still see uh, that uh, basically our uh, CPU architecture is using the same vulnerability as it was with the old multi-frequency phone systems, like uh, we are using the von Neumann architecture in the Intel and ARM uh, processors, which means that uh, the code and the data is hand handled uh, the same way, which leads to memory corruption issues like buffer overflow and similar things. Uh, so, surely there are many reasons why we are using the von Neumann architecture and not the Harvard architecture. Well, let's talk about the red boxes. Uh, again, uh, red boxes were about uh, that people wanted uh, to. Uh, do phone calls without paying um, any money for that. And um, basically, whenever you went uh, to a public phone and uh, you inserted your coins into the phone, uh, the phone uh, created a special signal and it sent this uh, special signal to the central phone system. So the central phone system knew uh, how much money you inserted into the phone system. So, and because uh, the same uh, uh, s uh, band was used uh, for the voice and the signal, uh, people were able to basically record what kind of uh, signal is sent uh, to the phone system whenever a coin is in. They just recorded the sound and then they were able to replay the sound and the phone system thought if someone just inserted the coin uh, into the system. And uh, this is basically on the quarter. You just basically recorded it on tape, played it back, and the phone system thought that you already paid uh, for that. Um, as you can see, I'm using a mobile phone app uh, for all these tones. Uh, there is one for on uh, Google Play Store for Android devices and there is one for iOS devices as well. Um, also, if you want to experiment uh, with this very old uh, multi-frequency phone system, uh, turns out there is a, a very interesting project called Project MF and they are basically operating, I mean, not operating, but emulating a really, a very, this very old multi-frequency phone system. So if you just uh, dial them, then you can try out all these uh, box and What's pretty funny, or not that funny at all, is that uh, in the old days, when someone had a blue box or a red box with them, uh, and uh, the police found it, then uh, it was able that uh, it was possible that they got into prison just because of having these boxes. And this is just an app which plays right now. All right, uh, how many of you guys are into hackers? Yeah, Th this is the same. 
Uh, I, I really like uh, the hackers movie because there are so many phone freaking techniques uh, uh, presented there and they are uh, technological correct uh, ones. All right, um, so again, I was thinking, uh, how is this vulnerability again uh, uh, reintroduced in modern days uh, when uh, basically the client sends the signal to the server that money was inserted and uh, turns out that uh, recently someone found a smart vending machine where the students were able to download an Android application for the vending machine. And uh, guess what they found when they reversed uh, the mobile application? It had an SQLite database and uh, the local SQLite database stored the amount of money which was deposited to the system. Yeah, thi this is not the way to design. People just don't learn. All right, uh, the next funny hack uh, is the something called one call restriction. Uh, again, uh, it is uh, said that uh, Joy Bubbles was the uh, first uh, who found out this hacking technique. Uh, just think about uh, an old phone, uh, which is basically locked, that uh, you cannot uh, dial any numbers. Uh, and uh, Joy Bubbles uh, had a very mean babysitter, uh, and uh, he really put on the phone. But Joy Bubbles found out that uh, basically uh, uh, Switching the hooks uh, on the phone can generate uh, the same pulses. Uh, so he was able to dial any phone just by clicking the switch. And again, this technique was uh, seen in the hackers movie as well. When this guy was in prison, he was able to call one number only, but then he was able to play with the switch hook and uh, emulate that uh, he's dialing. Uh, again, this is, uh, I think, very similar to something we call a weak uh, form of client-side client side security check. Uh, for example, uh, back in the days, I have seen a web application where they were doing SQL injection protection on the client side from JavaScript. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one seeing this. Have you guys seen something like this? Yeah, okay, so it, it still happens. And uh, it's just amazing when you see a JavaScript alert that, hey, this character is not allowed. So yeah, anyway. Uh, when it comes to freaking, uh, we also have to mention uh, Captain Crunch and um, he was always very enthusiastic uh, when it comes to phone hacking. Uh, for example, he really liked uh, to hop uh, through these uh, weight AES systems. And uh, for example, once he had an interview uh, with a journalist and uh, he basically demonstrated that uh, he was hopping through the whole planet, then at the end of the day, he was able to call himself and when he talked into the one phone, it took many, like, like 10 or 20 seconds before he was able to hear himself back because it was uh, such a long distance call. And um, actually this was uh, pretty effective uh, back in the days when uh, people were using manual switches because uh, tracing these calls was uh, pretty impossible. Uh, so I would say this was basically the first Tor network. Uh, we can see something similar in the Sneakers movie as well, but as far as I remember, uh, when the Sneakers movie came out, they were not using manual switches anymore, so it was not that effective at that time. All right. Um, because uh, back in the days, there were uh, basically people couldn't afford uh, internet connectivity or there was even no TCP IP internet connectivity at all. It was important that you can get uh, free calls basically. So that's 
that's why I think uh, there were so many different ways explored how people can circumvent uh, paying uh, for the phone. Um, again, back in the days in the US, um, there was this very strange uh, thing, which uh, is called a calling card number. It was basically introduced by small phone companies. Uh, that and the way it worked that uh, you bought this calling card, card num card number uh, for actual money. Then you called a local number. Then uh, you used your uh, calling card number, six-digit calling card number, which was basically used for authentication. And after that, you were able to uh, enter your, the long distance area code and uh, the phone number you want to call. Because it was six digit number and uh, basically more than thousands people, more than a thousand people were using uh, these calling card numbers for the same local number. It was very easy to brute force uh, these uh, card numbers. And uh, people basically just, uh, because Matt, B uh, back in the days, they, people already had uh, PCs at home and uh, there were DBS servers, which I'm going to show you uh, very soon. Uh, they were using their computers, their modems and the DBS servers to brute, brute force these calling card numbers. And whenever they found a working one, they just uh, posted these numbers on the BBSs. Uh, and it was very hard uh, to detect and catch these frauds because the logs uh, about uh, this brute force was uh, stored at a different company, which was mostly AT&T or something similar. And they were not very interested or motivated uh, to figure out these uh, frauds, which were basically uh, uh, happening at for another company's cost. Um, one another uh, interesting uh, technique for free calls was there's uh, uh, loop numbers uh, where uh, uh, basically if you dial one number and the number next to it, it was a test number which connected these two together and uh, calling those uh, were free because it was for uh, internal uh, phone testing purposes. And um, basically uh, hackers used these uh, test loop numbers all the time for free conference calls. Uh, and also some hackers just uh, printed out these numbers and uh, put on uh, phone boxes as stickers that, hey, you should call this number. And it was basically a chat roulette. When you called someone and you had no idea who you are calling. All right, so BBSs. Uh, how many of you guys have ever visited a BBS system? All right. I think uh, this audience uh, will have the most, uh, the highest percentage of people uh, doing that. I don't expect this at other conferences. Um, the first time I used the BBS system was like one year ago, so I don't have much experience with those. And first when I tried this out, I did not really understand the concept of it and why it works this strange way. Uh, but after, the, after a while, I, I really uh, understood uh, what is going on. Um, because when BBS uh, system started, uh, again, there was uh, no internet uh, and uh, I mean there was ARPANET and stuff like that but uh, not many people were connected to it so it was just basically the phone system and uh, whenever someone uh, operated a BBS server it meant that uh, they are using their phone line uh, for one connection so the whole system was optimized uh, that uh, clients connect to the BBS server for a very short amount of time, they transfer a very short amount of data, then they disconnect because otherwise the server operator has to maintain a lot of numbers. So just imagine that you are running a web server which can only handle one socket, one client at a time. 
Yeah, and uh, even back at those days, uh, this meant like 300 bit per second. So it was not an HD movie server or something like that. So basically just log people logged in, they downloaded all the new data from the BBS server, they uploaded what they want and disconnected. Um, no surprise, uh, as of today there are still uh, many BBS servers online and uh, you can just uh, Google for uh, BBS servers, register and just poke around with them. Um, I found a client called Netrunner on Windows which was uh, very nice uh, for BBS servers. It handled everything perfectly. Uh, an example BBS server looks like. Uh, you get a menu and you can uh, choose whatever you want. For example, I can list out the last callers and uh, I can also check the messages. Yeah, file transfer area was down, so I was not able to upload any files, unfortunately. And uh, what was, uh, here we can list uh, all the BBS servers they know of. Some of them are running on Commodore 64, which is great. And uh, also what was fun to see that uh, they were also providing uh, text-based games, uh, which is, uh, or could I say, not the way it meant to be used. Like uh, these games were meant for local playing mostly and uh, just keeping up a phone line because uh, you are um, playing with a text adventure game. That's, that's not very effective. But now in the times of TCP IP, it's nice. Yeah, why not? Take scroll. Go north. How many of you guys played with these text-based games? Yeah, all right, very cool. Uh, BBS systems were developed by developers, so there is uh, no surprise that there were vulnerabilities in BBS systems. Uh, one of the mostly known vulnerability was that uh, uh, because people uploaded files in batches, uh, people uploaded one zip file which was basically extracted uh, by the server and then people were able to download, uh, select the files they want to download. So if someone uh, basically hex edited the zip file and uh, renamed the file to dot dot slash something, then uh, the zip client on the BBS server uh, basically extracted uh, the, these files one uh, directory under, which was the main directory of the BBS server. So people were able to overwrite uh, key uh, executables of the BBS server. Uh, which was mostly set on auto start or something. So this way you were able to backdoor uh, someone's BBS server or just deny all of it or whatever. It was uh, pretty fun back in that days, as I heard. Uh, I was also trying to create uh, such a hack and uh, I was playing a little bit with uh, the BBS servers I found online. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't find a suitable vulnerable version to do that. But uh, while I was poking around, I found something very interesting. Uh, there is this uh, known BBS server called WWIVBBS and uh, turned out that uh, they had a security function called bad file name check where they checked the extension of a file and uh, when it was something very dangerous like um, CMD or um, executable or whatever, 
then uh, it will deny uh, uh, the uploading of these uh, files. And uh, turned out that in the original code, they did not put any comma in uh, some of these uh, lists. And in C, if you don't put comma here, I these strings just get concatenated. So basically this bad finding function was not working. Uh, I was trying to check for how long, maybe for 20 years or so. Uh, but um, turned out that there, they also there were another checks uh, in the uh, executable which prevented me from hacking. But uh, this is a very nice example of open source and if something is open source, then people will find vulnerabilities in it. Turned out that this vulnerability was there for more than 20 years. Anyway, uh, it was like one or two years ago when uh, people uh, found this vulnerability and it was overhyped all over the internet. They called this vulnerability zip slip. And um, yeah, it's true that uh, many uh, applications were vulnerable to this code, but still I don't think uh, this whole uh, vulnerability deserved this hype. What? So again, this is an example that uh, this happened way back, uh, but people just forget this uh, attack and now when they find it, they are very happy that I am the one, I, I found this. Cool, Usenet. How many Usenet users here? Awesome, awesome. Um, basically, Usenet uh, started, uh, I, I would say it's, uh, it mostly started on uh, the TCP IP internet uh, when it comes um, to the server synchronization. And it's basically the first uh, service which provided some forum-like functionality. Uh, think about Usenet uh, like a lot of servers synchronizing different messages which are organized in a directory structure. And uh, you can basically subscribe uh, to one uh, news group and uh, when you subscribe to that news group, when you log in to your Usenet server, uh, you will just download that, that data from your Usenet server. Um, it was very, very popular back in the days uh, for many different purposes, uh, but uh, quality really started to decline when uh, more and more people joined the internet. Uh, especially in the US when AOL was a thing, then uh, too many people flooded the Usenet and it was just not viable anymore. Um, and people also figured out that uh, they can post binary files uh, to Usenet groups and uh, they just had to split the files. Uh, and um, then uh, basically after if you uh, publish your file on a Usenet group, then people all over the world can download it. So no wonder that uh, piracy and uh, Juarez and porn started on Usenet. And um, again, there, when people created Usenet, they never really thought that so many people will, will use it. So moderation and administration was not uh, properly how could I say, uh, designed uh, into the Usenet protocol. Uh, I also uh, tried to check uh, whether I can still use Usenet today or not, and uh, turned out Usenet is more popular uh, than most people know. And the uh, reason is that uh, still many people use Usenet for Juarez and uh, movies and similar stuff. Uh, they just uh, really don't uh, advertise this because they believed that they can stay under the radar and uh, authorities will go after Torrent and Napster and whatever and um, don't touch Usenet. But uh, some years ago, authorities found out that, yeah, Usenet is 
used for wars as well, so they try to, to check that as well. Um, but uh, still, uh, as of today, there are many, many Usenet servers on the internet uh, you can subscribe to. Um, most of them have some free trial period, uh, but after that you have to pay a lot of money uh, just to connect to the Usenet servers. So uh, here uh, you can see that I registered uh, to the Viper News Usenet server and I'm using the TIN news reader for that. It's a bit slow, but it's okay. Yeah, and uh, these are the uh, test Usenet groups I uh, subscribe to. So here you can see messages uh, from people all over the world. Uh, again, uh, what's uh, important to see that uh, most Usenet servers, uh, they don't uh, keep uh, the files uh, forever. So there is a retention period on all of the Usenet servers, which means uh, many old uh, Usenet messages were lost or almost lost. Some people luckily archived those, but uh, if you connect now to a new Usenet server, you won't be able to see the old Usenet messages. You have te to definitely check for archives, like archive.org has some uh, old uh, Usenet archives, which is pretty fun to check. I can promise. Cool. Uh, the next interesting thing uh, is are the e-signs. Uh, first e-sign was from the cult of the dead cow. Dead cow. Uh, fun fact, uh, there is a journalist in the US who recently uh, mapped out the Cult of the Dead Cow team and group and how they worked together. And there is a very nice book uh, about this. Uh, I just started to read this, but it's a very good and interesting read. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with e -signs, uh And uh, yeah, some of them were just random jokes. Some of them had a lot of doxing in it. Um, also, there was uh, this hacker group called uh, Legion of Doom Hackers, uh, who were very famous back in the days. Uh, again, this is the time when Freck started, which is still a thing today. Um, IRC. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have to introduce to you guys what IRC is. Um, what I really miss nowadays from IRC is the net split and channel takeover and nickname colliding. When was the last time you have seen something like this? I'm pretty good. Yes, go ahead. One week. One week? Seriously? Okay. It's still happening. Still happening. Not that bad. Yeah, but can. Nickname collides definitely. Net splits all the time. But Especially with smart rectangles. Yeah, yeah, but can um, you. I mean, can you initiate the NAS split? Against smart rectangles, definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, again, the yeah. Those kitties are going against GitHub that are using terrible cross traffic. So, yeah, that develops the problem definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, what uh, many people don't know that IRC is still used for Vares and file exchange. Uh, like there are um, web pages on the internet where you can search uh, for uh, different movies and files like that. For, uh, for example, if you search for hackers, you will see a lot of, lot of uh, IRC servers with channels and uh, nicknames which you can contact. And uh, if you join uh, one virus channel, then uh, you are basically flooded with uh, the different messages that uh, these people can provide uh, these movies to you, like 
what's interesting here. I'm not sure. I don't really know some of these. I know I, I have seen Baywatch previously somewhere here. Like S Baywatch season four. Uh, anyway, but uh, these uh, channels are basically just flooded with these messages. And uh, I, I really don't know why people still think that IRC is a good protocol for this file sharing, but anyway. Cool. Uh, how many of you guys remember Ping of Death? All right, almost almost everyone. So uh, ba basically, what happened uh, is that um, when the uh, protocol was created, uh, there was uh, one second delay between the plus plus plus. Uh, uh, and the ATH0 command, uh, which meant that uh, sending this ping of death uh, to a modem, which uh, implemented the protocol carefully, uh, these uh, modems were not vulnerable, but because there was basically a patent troll uh, behind this protocol, uh, many people started to create modems, which uh, circumvented uh, this patent by dropping this uh, one second delay between the plus 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 and the ATH zero command, which meant that uh, if someone sent a string uh, to someone who had this vulnerable modem and this string was sent back, uh, then the plus 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 uh, triggered uh, in the modem that uh, the next uh, string is a command which you have to interpret and the ATH0 basically just uh, disconnected uh, the modem from the internet. So back in the days many trolls had fun with uh, sending these messages to people who had uh, these modems which were not compatible with the patent. And uh, again, uh, this uh, patent troll uh, was uh, from the internet. And even in comments uh, and everywhere, which meant that uh, people using uh, these uh, modems were basically just disconnected from the internet all the time. So b he basically marketed his own modem as this is something which works. All right. Um, yeah, when it comes to modems and uh, AT commands, uh, there is still research uh, which you can find that uh, even nowadays uh, smartphones implement these HT AT commands. And uh, for example, uh, the AT commands were exposed uh, through the USB interface, uh, which meant uh, people could uh, hide malicious components inside the USB docks chargers, and uh, then uh, use secret AT commands to rewrite, for example, the device firmware, things like that. Uh, I don't know how practical uh, this study was, but uh, yeah, AT commands are still used nowadays for sure. All right, uh, so let's talk about the Morris worm. Uh, the developer of the Morris worm was uh, Robert Morris. And it's very funny if you look at his uh, CV on one of the sites. Uh, it mentions that in 1988, his discovery of buffer overflow first brought the internet to the attention of the general public, which is a very fun way to tell that, yeah, I wrote the Morris worm and it almost broke the internet. Um, I uh, started to experiment with the Morris worm and uh, my goal was that uh, I have uh, multiple systems which are capable of running the Morris worm and I infect one of the systems and let's see how it can infect my other systems. So the plan was that uh, I find an emulator 
of uh, BSD uh, 4.3, which runs Morris Worm. Then I download the source code for the Morris Worm from GitHub. Then uh, I can basically uh, copy the source code to the operating system, which is not trivial because uh, back in those days there were no web servers at all. I compile the code, run, and everything works. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Morris Worm source code, which has been published on GitHub, is uh, not uh, fully functional. Like um, some of these functions are uh, missing. And uh, these are crucial uh, for the Worm functionality. And uh, yeah, they say for copyright reasons, he didn't want to publish these codes. Uh, and yeah, I don't think this is a good way to preserve uh, such important code. Um, I think I have spent like two days trying to figure out and reverse engineer how I should implement these functions and I ended up here. Uh, yes? Uh, I, I checked that as well, but I ha don't remember why I couldn't figure that out. But I might revisit that plan as well. But yeah, yeah, the issue was not the crypt, but the other two functions. But uh, yeah, I was having a hard time to find those. Uh, I also wanted to do a small comparison of this Morris worm from 1988 and the NotPetya worm uh, from two years ago. And uh, turns out that they have a lot in common. Uh, for example, scans the network for new victims. They both exploit memory corruption to spread. They both exploit password reuse to spread. Uh, the Morris worm basically broke the internet and caused panic. Uh, not Petya didn't really break the internet, but almost. Uh, for both worm, there was vaccine available, uh, which if you used that, you could you were able to prevent uh, infection. Uh, Morris worm just runs fine if it doesn't have any admin privilege. To use the password reuse me module, uh, it needed admin privileges. Uh, this is a speculation from my part. Uh, there is uh, no documentation in it, uh, but it is uh, highly probable that the buffer overflow uh, exploit uh, used by uh, Robert Morris was leaked by the NSA because his father used to work for NSA and uh, we are years before Aleph 1 article. So it's, it's I would say, uh, it's, a high, it's a coincidence that someone uh, whose father is uh, working for the NSA just publishes a code about how to do buffer overflow. Uh, we also you know that NotPetya used a leak code from the NSA uh, but the Morris firm was coded by a single university student and NotPetya was coded by an APT threat actor. Maybe another university student. Uh, on the left you can see a very, very old ransomware called AIDS and uh, on the right NotPetya. They are pretty similar, similar when it comes to design. So uh, even APT threat actors stole from old school stuff, which is nice. Cool, uh, Gopher. How many of you guys used Gopher? Still. Still? Yeah, the third uh, directory for, for Gopher. Okay, awesome. So, uh, you can uh, still, uh, there are some websites on the internet uh, which are basically Google for Gopher, uh, where you can uh, find nice Gopher sites. And, uh, Luckily, our favorite browser links uh, can be used uh, for uh, gophering. Like, uh, this is just an example site I found. 
basically how you should imagine uh, Gopher is like uh, you can browse directory and through the directories you can see texts and maybe sometimes download uh, some image whatever so it's it's really the very very old world wide web Windows 95 some people might know where I'm getting with this um, back in the days uh, I went into a CTF competition and uh, one of the machines uh, was a Windows 95 machine there and uh, as far as I remember no one could hack that machine and uh, when I came home uh, I really got pissed that uh, this is a very old vulnerable uh, machine and we hipsters could not hack it so we should dig deeper and do something about it um, so I basically just set up uh, Windows 95 lab in my home uh, and what I really wanted to do is to hack the system with existing tools. I really don't, didn't want to develop something new for that. Uh, I had to achieve remote code execution, but without any user interaction. Uh, default Windows 95 uh, doesn't have any network connectivity, so I had to configure those. And by default, there are no services running, so I had to create a writable C share for that. Uh, I believe that was the case with the CTF uh, machine as well. Uh, turns out that there, is, there was a very fun vulnerability uh, in the old uh, Windows machines, where basically, uh, here you can see, to verify the password, the length of the password depends on the length of the data sent from the client to the server. So if a client set the length of password to be one byte, and send the packet with plain text password to the server, the server will only compare it with the first byte of the... Uh, this is basically the true uh, Hollywood style hack, when you can uh, figure out your password uh, character by character. And uh, while I was Googling, uh, I found uh, this tool, uh, Share Password Cracker Checker, which uh, basically did this hack for me, uh, but I was not very satisfied with it. Uh, so at the end of the day, I uh, re-implemented it in Metasploit. Um, basically, here the network dump, uh, how it looks on the wire. So I, my program already figured out that the first part of the password is pass. Then it is trying G H I. K, L, M, blah, blah, blah. And here you can see it finds uh, W and uh, it gets a different answer. So now it knows that the fourth character is W and now it can uh, continue with breaking the other characters. And uh, here you can see it. In so here is the Windows 95 uh, C share. And uh, here is my Metasploit module. Um, here you can see that delay is set to zero, but uh, I have uh, monkey patched my code, so there is a delay here. And uh, now it's really, really slow, but uh, if you remove the delay uh, from the code, then it can basically guess the password in like two seconds or so. So it's really, really fast. Like, yeah, here you can see that it can find out all the characters one by one. So whenever, um, I will probably uh, publish this code uh, this year. So whenever you want to hack a Windows 95 uh, share, then you can either check my GitHub or uh, just download the other tool I just show you. All right, so uh, 
how many of you guys know the hacking tool Fluxi? Yes, I can show you something new. Um, this was a Chinese tool, uh, but uh, it was um, it also had a translated uh, English version uh, with uh, some uh, misspellings, like uh, split dictionary uh, meant to be split dictionary stuff like that, but uh, this is 2002 and this was a graphical user interface hacking tool with many, many interesting fu functions like uh, NTPipe remote shell, download NTSAM, uh, install ARP network sniffer, PC Anywhere password decipher, get username form Unix password file, it was pretty, pretty awesome. Here you can see a screenshot about it. This is 2002. All right, so that's all uh, I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, if you have comments, let me know. Uh, and if you want to contact me, you can do that on my website, https colon forward slash forward slash www.zoltanbalazs.com.com. That's really my site. I'm serious. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I think that what, what you mentioned the first part that many of these vulnerabilities are, are re rediscovered in new settings, in new contexts. And uh, it reminds me of these uh, SSL vulnerabilities of, of these last years with the, with the long, long names and logos. Because in that case, you said that, yeah, SSL is protecting everything and now we, TLS is still protecting it. But we have this, instead of JavaScript, which can send uh, requests in the context of the user's crypto session. So yeah. I, I think that's the same, same spirit. I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs>